going on, guys? What's up, Ray? Looks like we got a couple people in here. You guys want me to get rolling now or should I wait for a little bit? Get going. Let's get on it. Let's get going. All right, let's do it, man. All right, so first let me introduce myself. My name is Ray Carr. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a physical therapist at Precision Performance Physical Therapy inside Maple Zone Sports Institute. Um, myself, John Herding, we work very closely with Rob and, you know, his guys. Uh, just a little background information on me. Um, I have a doctorate degree, certified strength and conditioning coach. Uh, and I've been treating for six years, all, all of which with, uh, with, have been with athletes, uh, primarily baseball. Um, so today we're going to talk a little arm care. Okay, guys? Um, something that's really critical for you players to stay healthy, for you coaches to keep your players on the field, all right? Um, I think before jumping into the arm care, I think it's important we should uh, dive into a little bit of anatomy first, okay? Um, because understanding, I'm gonna kind of do a whole entire comprehensive uh, review here of an arm care program that I feel like I had built over the course of these six years. Um, through experience, through failure, right, and through success. Um, so anatomy-wise, let's break down the body. Think about it as in two skeletons, okay? You have your axial skeleton, which is your rib cage, your pelvis, and your spine, all right? And then you got your appendicular skeleton, okay, which your extremities, all right? Um, in terms of anatomy that's most involved with throwing, let's obviously, you know, gear in, zoom into the shoulder, right? So you got your scapula, your shoulder blade, right? And how that articulates with the glenoid, which is the socket of the shoulder, and then the humerus, which is the arm bone, okay? So we got the arm bone, the humerus, the glenoid, which is the shoulder socket, and the scapula, probably three of the most important things from an anatomy standpoint, bony standpoint, um, that I want you guys to kind of get a uh, grasp of here, all right? Um, so now taking that anatomy, let's take a look and let's discuss all right, baseball and how that creates postural influences and asymmetries, right? Baseball is obviously, you know, performed in the frontal plane, transverse plane, right? Uh, typically one side of the body is doing one thing, the other side of the body is doing other, right? So what it creates is asymmetries from side to side. And this is where I think the first thing in terms of an arm program, you almost need to have a baseline assessment performed, right? Whether it's by someone like myself, whether it's by someone like Rob, George, right? You need to have, from a mobility standpoint, assess, you know, hip internal rotation, shoulder internal rotation, shoulder flexion, right? Rib cage position, right? And I think, you know, starting from the inside out here, I think a lot of times baseball, and Rob, you probably agree, what do you see with your players, right? These guys are rotated a little bit to the right, side bend it, right, depressed in the shoulder, right, and they live there, okay? And what it does is it just creates opportunity for injury, really, all right? So getting that assessment done to look at hip internal rotation, right, because look, if you don't have good left hip internal rotation on, say, a right-handed pitcher, when that left leg is landing and you're trying to get over and internally rotate, on the femur, uh, you know, if you can't if you can't function and get that, and you don't have the capacity to perform that, ultimately, what is it going to lead? It's going to lead you to open up, flail out, extend in your lower back, and add, you know, increased stress to the anterior shoulder, medial elbow, right, which no one wants. Okay, so um, I would say from a baseline assessment, some of the main things we look at: shoulder flexion, shoulder internal rotation is a huge one as well. Um, I find shoulder IR is kind of a way for, uh, you know, think about your capacity to decelerate after ball release, right? And if you don't have that capacity, you're still going to release the ball. Don't get me wrong. But guess what's going to happen is something's going to take on a lot more stress than it needs to upstream, most commonly the posterior rot uh, rotator cuff. Um, T-spine mobility, right? Another huge one. Another thing that should be part of the assessment, um, 
And then I would say scapular rotation, right? We need upward rotation of the scapula. What I mean by that, and it's performed by a muscle called the serratus anterior, all right? You have your scapula, and as you lift up overhead, you need it to upwardly rotate in this fashion, okay, guys? Um, a lot of times, like, you'll, you know, you know, people note, like, scapular winging. I'm not really huge on that. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times it's poor position centrally in that axial skeleton that I mentioned in terms of the pelvis, rib cage, and spine uh, that's leading to a faulty scapular position that ultimately decreases recruitment of the serratus anterior and leads to stress elsewhere. Um, so some ways to combat those dysfunctions, right? I think one thing, and you know, this is something we talk a lot about, unilateral loading, okay? Um, I would put unilateral loading up there as a priority. I think rotator cuff activation, another priority. Serratus anterior, another priority. Um, and then again, just ensuring proper mobility throughout the extremities and centrally, you know, like teaching anterior trunk control. Um, I'm not saying like you need to keep, you know, the ribs are going to flare a little bit when throwing, don't get me wrong, but you need to have that ability and that stability uh, to keep those ribs down uh, as much as possible. Um, and then once you have that mobility, right, this is where Rob does a great job. You got to train it, okay? You got to train, you got to learn to stabilize through it to really own that mobility. Um, otherwise, you know, you know, mobility without stability just creates injury, right? That's when we see those hypermobile individuals that will typically, you know, have over, you know, overstress and repetitive stress type injuries. Um, just because of the laxity that they naturally have. Okay. Um, let's jump into, why don't we jump into proper warm up? All right. Because I think from a standpoint here, after reviewing the anatomy, going through some of the postural influences, I think in terms of an arm care program, now going outside of the clinic here, okay, let's talk proper warm up. And I think, I think foam rolling is a great way to get started. You know, I think it preps the tissue. I mean, not everyone's a huge fan of foam rolling. Uh, I happen to be, honestly. I think, um, you know, I think it preps the tissue. It increases tissue perfusion, meaning blood flow to the muscle. And I think before any kind of physical activity, ultimately, you know, I mean, that's going to be, that's a positive thing to increase blood flow, right? We want to lubricate the joint, the tissue, right? It's just only going to help us better prepare for performance, all right? Um, and then I think you got to get dynamic. Okay, after you foam roll out the lats, the pec, all right, the posterior cuff, upper trap, you know, mid scap, you know, after that, I mean, you got to get dynamic, okay? Um, something we use a lot in the clinic, uh, George, I know you're not the biggest fan of, uh, of Tom House, but we, we, love his, uh, we love his individual, like his individual dynamic warm up. I mean, uh, you know, it's a way just to, you know, I think the dynamic stuff is better than the mechanical stuff. I'll say that. All right, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, man. But um, I mean, yeah, the dynamic stuff, you know, I just think about it in a sense is like there's tons of stuff to do for the lower extremity, right? You know, dynamically, you know, whether it's walking RDLs, walking quad pulls, you know, scoops, whatever it is, karaoke, you know, like we have that for the lower quarter. I think for the upper quarter, I think people struggle. I think coaches um, struggle. I think therapists struggle to find things to prep their players. Um, and, you know, I mean, that was like a lot of what really took me time to find. Like I, I was using Indian clubs a lot. I'm still a big fan of Indian clubs. Um, I think, you know, it's a dynamic way to take you through a wide range and a wide variety of uh, motion um, while also flossing the nervous system, which is huge. Okay. Um, and then I think after your foam roll, after you do your dynamic stuff, then you got to get specific to what you're going to do, right? And that's throwing, okay? So ultimately, you know, that's where I kind of would hand this off to George. Um, and, you know, I think it's going to vary on an individual basis. You know, I think some players like to extend out and get long, you know? I think some players like to use weighted balls. I think some players like to use, you know, J-bands. You know, I think, I think you know, I'm not against one or the other. Um, I just think, I think you have to find what works for you when it comes to that stuff. But I just think that trio as a way of pre warm up for throwing that is critical to our arm care program, right? Because you have to prep your system properly. I think foam rolling, mobilizing the tissue, 
being dynamic with the upper quarter and then following you up with something that the player and or coach has found to be effective for them from a throwing standpoint, okay? Um, and then I guess we can get into post throwing, all right? I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of lactate flush, right? I think like naturally like your throwers are going out there and you know, you have a pitcher going to the bump that's gonna throw a hundred pitches, right? Naturally, there's a lot of lactate that builds up in the system uh, during that period of time. Um, and so I think the first thing that should be done is a lactate flush, like an active flush, whether it's running, whether it's getting on a salt bike, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I think that has to be performed and I think that should be priority one. Uh, after that, I think additional foam rolling is good. I think, you know, to mobilize the tissue even more, help with recovery, assist with recovery, promote recovery, right? Um, and then after that, like when you're leaving the field, what's critical, right? Or even before you leave the field, it's going to be nutrition and supplements, all right? And then lastly, sleep, okay? I think like in terms of a post-recovery arm care, I think those four things, right? Lactate flush, some rolling out to mobilize the tissue, some light static stretching even at that point. Um, Nutrition supplements, all right? You gotta replenish what you lost during the game, okay? Um, that's critical. And I, I think from a supplement standpoint, I'm a big fan of the three teens, glutamine, creatine, and protein. Um, I think they're huge. I'm also a big fan of Wobenzyme N, which is, is in the same class as uh, glucosamine and chondroitin, right? It's a joint supplement. Uh, and then I'm a huge fan of collagen. Right, collagen we have naturally in our body. Um, it's something you can add to your post-workout shape that just helps promote tendon and ligament health, right? Because what are some of the most common injuries in baseball, right? Rotator cuff tendinopathy, biceps tendinopathy, UCL injury, right? That's a ligament injury, right? So taking some of these supplements post-throwing and just on a daily basis in general can help just further get ahead of that curve, ultimately. So, um, and then why don't we move on to uh, some modalities, actually, I had, I wanted to discuss a little bit um, in terms of post-workout and arm care. So I think this is like, we get these questions all the time, too. That's another reason why I want to talk about it. Um, like ice first heat, okay? Uh, I'm not a huge proponent of ice. Um, I think, you know, I think there's a place for it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but ultimately, I feel like nine times out of 10, uh, you know, I feel like we need to promote blood flow to the area, right? There's three stages of the healing process, guys. Inflammation, repair, remodeling, okay? So inflammation is something that we need to take place. Like, it's something that has to happen. So ice is only going to impede on that, on that happening and really delay your recovery. Um, you know, so like, in a situation like in an arm, shoulder, elbow, from a care standpoint, like those aren't, those aren't regions of the body that we are really concerned about swelling, okay? Like it's, not like it's not like a sprained ankle or something like that, guys. So, I mean, use heat, man. I mean, if you're gonna use anything, use heat. Um, and then we get a ton of questions about East units, right? So, Mark Pro, Myoplux is what we use a lot. Uh, the stimulants have really grown, but the one thing that has stayed consistent is they work via, it's called the gate control theory of pain, okay? So ultimately what that means and what that theory says is wherever you slap the electrodes, okay, on the arm, the elbow, all right, there's pain receptors, noci receptors in those areas, all right? And what's gonna happen when you place those stim pads there you're gonna, those stim pads and the current interfere with the ability of those pain receptors to communicate with your brain, all right? So you're gonna get short-term pain relief and some additional blood flow, which can certainly be beneficial to arm care and arm recovery post-throwing, okay? So I'm here, I'm talking about, I'm talking about what can we do at home, you know, after we've replenished, after we're checking that box that we're sleeping, right? These are some added things. Another thing that I really have been recommending much more commonly, especially now, um, is cupping set, right? Um, you know, because again, like mobilizing the tissue, whether you want to use a foam roller, a lacrosse ball, 
right? I think, I think things work at different levels. Um, so the way I look at it, and like I use like a whole variety of soft tissue techniques, um, but cupping, I think, manipulates the tissue at a more superficial layer, or at the more superficial layers, um, right? While the cups are on there, it's going to restrict blood flow and oxygen, okay? So that's why you get the bruising, right? Because necrotic tissue, dead tissue ultimately, um, is black, right? So when your tissue dies, it's black. So that's why you get the bruising because ultimately while the cups are on there, we're inflicting a little bit of trauma, right? Because we wanna guide the body's internal response to that area, all right? So the cupping is gonna manipulate the tissue at a superficial layer. And then once you remove the cups, is you're gonna get a huge influx. And in the courses I've taken, I've heard anywhere from a six to eight times multiplier of normal blood flow and oxygen which is what you need from a healing standpoint and a recovery standpoint right so if you're talking arm care right you want to get all the oxidized cells all the nutrients you need for healing to that area all right um i think in the clinic other modalities that i'll use like scraping and i'm even you know hearing more of like self scraping becoming more popular uh because it is something really you can do individually and independently at home um, I think with, you know, depending on how much elbow pressure and hand pressure you're using, like you're going to manipulate the tissue at a little bit deeper of a level, similar to that maybe of like a foam roller or lacrosse ball. Um, and then really for those, for those restrictions in terms of at the bottom layers of the tissue and the tissue up against the bone, that's where, that's where you would need to come see someone like myself or John for, you know, some dry needling, um, which I won't get into a whole lot of, but it's just an effective way for us to further manipulate tissue at deeper levels, all right? Um, and then, so let's talk about a little bit, like from an arm care standpoint, like I think it's important that, you know, you have to go to the origin of the issue, right? Like, you know, I think a lot, I see like in my six years, you know, communicate with a lot of PTs, like, you know, someone shows up with knee pain, you know, and they treat the knee pain, but you know, it's probably something coming from upstream, right? So I think that's important to note, like even with like the shoulder, I think, you know, if it's an elbow issue, or, you know, I think it's important to look upstream. You have to find the origin of the issue ultimately, because otherwise you're just gonna continue going in circles. All right, guys, um, I think uh, in terms of things and controllables, I think programming, right? Load management is a very popular term nowadays. Um, I think, uh, I think that obviously is going to play a role. Like if you have a, if you have a 13 year old kid, you know, going out throwing 130 pitches every five days, like, you know, with, with no body awareness or no baseline assessment, you know, like ultimately that kid's probably going to break down and, and, you know, come across some pathology in the shoulder or elbow or scap region. Right. Um, so, and then I would say one thing load management, right? Uh, and then mechanics, right? Mechanics are huge. Um, you know, faulty mechanics can lead to certainly stress in different, in different parts of the body that you don't want, right? Like I mentioned earlier, if you don't have good hip internal rotation on that left side, like ultimately it could cause you to further extend in your lower back, maybe result in back pain. It could cause you to flail out, cause anterior shoulder pain, or even maybe in your cocking phase, maybe a lot of stress on the medial elbow, right? So, you know, that's just an example, like from a mechanical standpoint, like how that ties in to that baseline assessment, right? Like you got to find out, like no, no, no one person moves exactly the same. So you need that baseline assessment to, to find those asymmetries, find those dysfunctions, to address them so that you have a better chance of, you know, not only performing, at a higher level, but staying healthier um, throughout throughout the entire season. Okay. Um, so, and then I think one thing like training from like a recovery and arm care standpoint, I think your training has to align with your recovery, you know, and like, I'm a big believer in that. It's not like I'm trying to get more business or anything like that. I just think like, you know, certain guys who are inflicting certain amount of stress on their body, I think they need certain recovery you know, and you see it at the highest levels, like, and, you know, I'm sure Rob and George can, can, uh, you know, attest to this, that like, you know, like, they're, like those players at the highest levels, they have their entire own training staff, they're getting worked on every single day. I mean, 
You know, it's just, it's something that has to happen. Um, you know, not only to get that baseline assessment, but yeah, for that recovery stuff that maybe you can't just handle on your own, or maybe it's just, you don't handle on your own. Um, so yeah, and then in terms of, I think I'm, I'll go mention like, all right, so what happens if you don't follow these, right? Like what happens if we don't take care of the arm? I think I would say like the three biggest, four biggest things, I think posterior cuff or just general bicipital like tendinopathy. All right, what's a tendinopathy? Like everyone I think is familiar with tendinitis, right? But naturally now that term has kind of been outdated because what we have found is tendinitis indicates something more acute, right? Like, you know, like you went out and pitched one day and then bam, the next day, yeah, that's an acute inflammatory response. That's research has shown that that's not really how it works, right? That like it's this inflammatory response is something that is likely building over a much longer period of time. And so that's why you're hearing tendinosis, tendinopathy. Um, so I would say bicipital, rotator cuff, flexor tendinopathy in the forearm, right? And then I would say UCL and labrum, right? And those are structures. The labrum is what creates the suction like effect between that humerus bone that I mentioned and the glenoid, right? So we're always trying to increase arm velo, right, George? Like, that's what happens. Like, the labrum naturally is going to take on more stress. So that's why, again, going back to the recovery stuff, it's imperative, uh, imperative for us to flush that area with blood flow, oxygen, you know, nutrients, everything it needs to replenish itself. Um, and the same goes with, I think, I think UCLs. I think that goes back to a lot of times what I mentioned from a volume standpoint and a mechanical standpoint. I think, I think people, you know, naturally, I think pitchers, because of the amount of external rotation they have, like are always going to take on like that, that ligament, okay? So that's what the UCL is, ulnar collateral ligament. Ligaments attach bone to bone. Tendons attach muscle to bone, just to uh, review that. So this ligament, right, is attaching your elbow joint together, all right? And so when you go into max external rotation in your cocking phase, like there's naturally going to be a lot of stress on there, right? And so naturally, right, we need to replenish that area as well. Um, so again, guys, recovery has to align with training. Um, remember, get a baseline assessment. Uh, and, you know, I'm here to take any questions, but that's kind of all I had. Right. So there's a couple of questions in the chat. Not sure if you saw them or not. You touched on one of Gavin's questions, which was uh, just about talking about like post throwing stuff, uh, about going for runs. I think you covered that one. The other one he had, um, I don't know if you mentioned it or not during your modalities discussion was about icing. You want to just quickly touch on icing. It does it work. Does it not work? Would you recommend it post throwing? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I talked a little bit about, all right. So yeah, Gavin, um, flushing out lactic acid. I do recommend, I think running is the most effective way. Something active we have, it's active flush, right? I think running, you know, a salt bike, anything, anything active like that, you know, do four by 400 meter runs with resting one to one, right? To help flush that lactate that's built up. Um, and again, after that, I wouldn't really recommend icing. Now, I think from a coaching standpoint, right? Like I think some players have iced their entire careers, right? And I think naturally when building a relationship with a player, there's going to be compromise, okay? And so sometimes, you know, I'm, I won't take that from the player. If the player is like, you know, I've iced every single time after I throw, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to strip that from them, all right? But what I am going to do is I'm going to push and advocate for the things I do believe in, which I mentioned in terms of post, uh, in terms of post throwing, right? Lactate flush, which we just talked about with the running, um, some additional foam rolling. Okay. I prefer heat or kind of a stim unit or something along those lines. Um, and then I really think nutrition and sleep are probably your best go-tos. Um, and then I see another question on here. Would you recommend cupping on the arm or just the shoulder? Uh, to be truthful, I, th I think both could use it. Um, you know, I think I think certain pitchers are more susceptible to inflammatory responses um, in certain areas due to those mechanical faults or lack of mobility in certain places or lack of stability in certain places. 
So if you're someone that commonly is sore post throwing in your elbow more so than the shoulder, I would say cuff in your elbow. If you're someone that cuff gets pretty torn up after throwing, then maybe we need to look at your IR, your internal rotation, and I would I would recommend cuffing there. Um, but you know, I mean, ultimately, I don't think you could go wrong with cuffing in either either spot. Is there anything you would recommend to do to decrease the amount of stress on the UCL? Yeah, I think so. I think from a UCL perspective, to decrease the amount of stress, I think it goes back to mechanics, right? And what do mechanics go back to? Mobility and stability, right? So I think I think it starts from, you know, think about when you build a house, right? John always uses this analogy, like you need a solid foundation to build upon, okay? So I think teaching anterior trunk control, right? I think teaching left AF internal rotation, which means acetabulum moving on the femur, okay? Which has to happen on the left side for a right-handed pitcher. Um, you know, I think having the proper thoracic mobility, right? I think, you know, these are all things, these are all prerequisites that are going to help reduce stress on the UCL. Um, and then ultimately at load management, right? Um, from a mechanic, after that, after the mobility, stability stuff, like load management and mechanics, you know, um, they kind of go hand in hand. Band exercises that I recommend, uh, good question. I mean, I'm not against crossover symmetry, J-band routines. I think those are fine. Um, I think though, the way I look at the system, the body, right? I think there's prime movers and prime stabilizers. Some of my players have heard me talk about this. So in the shoulder, right, I think our prime movers, right? Your pec, your lat, the deltoid, you know, your prime stabilizers are the serratus that I talked about that's responsible for upward rotation of the scapula, right? Uh, the rotator cuff is huge, right? In terms for you to lift up overhead without getting shoulder impingement, the rotator cuff has to literally pull down the humerus so that when it comes up, it doesn't jam into your supraspinatus tendon, your bicipital tendon, and the subacromial bursa, right? Um, so again, I think taking that, I think we shouldn't train our prime movers and our prime stabilizers the same, all right? Like our prime movers are the ones we're training four by eight, you know, four by six, whatever it is. The prime stabilizers, I would recommend going more for time under tension work, right? So recommendations outside of the band stuff, maybe some farmer's carries, right? Because again, remember what I said about how the cuff is responsible for stabilizing the glenohumeral joint, right? So in terms of acting on that rotator cuff, whether you do a suitcase carry, a 90-90 carry, a 90-90 carry is elbow at shoulder height, right angle here, uh, or maybe an overhead carry, right? All good to get the cuff firing. I also think some closed chain work through the hands, getting dynamic, you know, I'll commonly have people go through foot ladders on their hands. I think that's another way to force the cuff to act in a different fashion. Um, I think serratus wall sides are huge, right? Um, just to maximize upward rotation, reduce impingement. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope that answers your questions. In terms of the band stuff, I'm fine. And then cuff, like one, one thing I will use, like, so using that example of not training the cuff because it's a prime stabilizer and like, and training it like a prime mover. So one thing, just simple, instead of doing your IR and ER like this and here, like we commonly use walkouts. Um, different positions, up in your throwing positions, resistant in both directions, or sometimes just even down by the side, right? These are areas, what you're doing when you're walking out and you're maintaining that position against a cable or band resistant resistance, you're forcing the cuff to stabilize against your own movement. And that's, that's what the cuff is supposed to do, right? The cuff's not supposed to be a prime mover. Like when we start using the cuff as a prime mover, that's when we get bursitis, tendinopathies, right? That's when we start getting labral issues, right? So I would, I would think about band exercises, sure, but I would also think about some time under tension training, you know, whether it's carries, some closed chain, putting pressure through the hands, or some of those walkouts I just talked about. Let's see. I think that was it. Is that it? Yeah. All right, man, I thought that went pretty well. You guys have any questions or thoughts? Ray, that was awesome.
Appreciate it, man. Um, should I stop this now? Yeah, so just uh, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, I mean, um, probably do something similar sometime next week. Um, and then, right, you just click leave meeting in the bottom. End meeting? Yeah, end meeting. That, and that will record it? Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Hey, thanks, thanks guys. for joining. Um, hey, if you need me, you can find me on social media, Ray Carr underscore DPT. Feel free to DM me, Ray Carr, on Facebook or email ray at precisionperformancept.com. Okay, feel free to use me as much of a resource uh, as you need, guys. All right. Uh, so, here for all your needs, questions, concerns, anything. Um, appreciate everybody joining today. Uh, had a great time talking. Love talking arm care, baseball, the whole nine. So, good stuff. All right, guys. Thanks, guys. See ya. See ya.